Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming all this way to the IT Amphitheater to welcome Dr. Michael Veal. It's a very great pleasure for me that he accepted this invitation. So I have here his uh, short bio, but you have the link for his website, and uh, he tweets regularly so that you can see more. He's Associate Professor at University College London, the Faculty of Laws, and his research is focused on the challenges of new technologies f uh, created for the users and the producers of technology. He spe specifically um, studies uh, privacy-enhanced technology and machine learning. So we have the pleasure to have him here today and tomorrow. Tomorrow the subject is different. Everything is on Indico. You can uh, look it up on there. Thank you, Michael. It's a Thanks, pleasure. Maria. Thanks, and hi, everyone. Yeah, it's great to be here. I'm holding a remote. I'm not sure if it's going to work. Um, great. So, uh, as Maria said, I'm here to talk a bit about data and power and the trajectory of, of the interaction of technologies, markets, businesses, societies, governments. Um, and we'll focus today a bit on platforms and infrastructures and then think tomorrow around particularly ad tech and targeting and uh, markets of people's attention and how those are developing and changing. Um, uh, the title that is Platforms All the Way Down um, indicates that uh, I think platforms and also infrastructures as well are both very good framings for understanding um, all kinds of issues in our digital economy. And we have to think about what these really mean, what facilities, functionalities, strategies, organizations use when they become platforms. That includes in scientific domains just as much as in consumer domains or news or media or so on. Um, and what this implies for how we and our organizations and our governments and similar should be interacting with them. So here, my kind of high-level um, sort of preview of, of what I want to look at today, um, regulating technology requires grappling with the business models behind it a little bit. And, and we get quite focused on the regulation of technology being about its technical characteristics. And those are really important, but we can also ignore the way they interplay with strategies that deploy those technical characteristics in practice. Um, similarly, there's also a misunderstanding about what technology-centered businesses or firms or tech giants or similar, but also smaller companies, how they operate, the mechanisms by which they establish and retain power, and what they actually want out of the end of it. And I don't just mean profit. I mean, that's obviously a, a core motivation behind companies in the current method of, model of corporate governance. I mean more about how they get there, the intermediate stages in which they deploy and configure technological systems to their ends. And feel free, by the way, when we go through to ask any questions as we go along. I'm happy to make this as interactive as, as you want. So business models, they are moving away from uh, their traditional approach, which is what I'm uh, going to look at in a second, about how we tame networks and uh, extract spaces for exploitation out of those networks into something that's much, much, in a way, more scary. The ability to, you know, without really asking, configure huge parts of our environments and societies in ways that makes it very difficult for us as societies to navigate with them. And we're going to think about what society and what government should play as a role in that world. To begin with, yeah, let's put around these two words, networks and platforms. Networks, I think we all have a pretty good grasp of, whether it's from something like network theory um, or, or just the kind of con concept of what it is for organizations to be networked and connected to each other by uh, edges and nodes, for example. But one of the most famous networks is, of course, the Internet, um, you know, going back nearly really you know, over half a, half a century now. Um, it's been with us for a very long time, particularly in the, uh, in the scientific space. And, of course, it you know, doesn't even need to be said the role of, of CERN in this. And, of course, just literally just, you know, just uh, meters away, we have one of the two Internet exchange points in Switzerland. Um, but the design principles of the Internet, which are often sort of theorized about where they you know, come from, uh, how, how the Internet was, was designed through its technical architecture in order to have some sort of politics, um, they're often summarized as openness, redundancy, interoperability, and end-to-end. -end. For those of you who are not sort of Internet scholars, you'll, um, you know, a brief feeling of what these are, openness defined as anyone can uh, access the standards needed 
to join this network and participate in them. They're not sort of proprietary knowledge required to be involved, although we use the word open quite a lot in technology, but we do have to think about what exactly is open to whom and under what situations. It's just like it's a very nice word. You add the word open to the beginning of everything. It sounds good. Redundancy is also meant to um, be a quite political part of this network. You know, it's often pointed to the, the foundations of, of um, the TCP IP protocol and packet switching in general before that as a, as a, as a theorized approach and deployed approach to um, sending packets across the world as a way that you can avoid any central point of control. You reduce the bottlenecks by creating redundancy. There are more than one route. There's more than one route for a packet to get to its destination, so you put any obstruction in the way and it will divert around it. And the idea being is it should be therefore quite difficult to control this network or to limit it. Interoperability, the idea that people can add things to this network, it's quite a, a add things to the central backbone without permission. Um, and in doing so, Connecting this devices without having central planning, you don't need to go to an authority and say, look, hello, can I add my device to this network? And this is supposed to, is supposed to you know, create a lack of path dependency. Again, limiting the ability for this network to be controlled. And the end-to-end -end principle, where an intelligence of a network, like the computers and so on, are on the edge of the network, and the network itself takes a very simple, passive, uh, ideally neutral, though that is another word that's loaded with meaning, uh, role, and, and as a result, the network does the minimal possible to move packets to its destination. The intelligence on the edge, which again is quite difficult to capture because the edge is a difficult thing to, to take one node and to, um, to, to use it to influence the entire network. So all of these uh, design principles are supposed to make it difficult to control the internet. And this is obviously, as anyone who's been on the internet uh, recently, is, is maybe, has maybe not worked as well as the, um, the, the initial theorists and designers of this would have anticipated. Um, one of the reasons for this is the platform business model and the platform model that's emerged. The metaphor of a platform, we can think of it as a sort of raised surface within a network. Um, and that implies that there is an edge to this surface. That implies that it's somehow easier to move across this surface than it is to go outside it. And that is a bit different than the, you know, the model of a network, where as long as you can find a route to your destination, you should be able to get there. It is effectively a strategy of bounding and privatizing and disciplining, bounding networks and privatizing and disciplining infrastructures. And there's no one way to make a platform, but the metaphor is quite a useful one, um, and what we you know, sort of geometrically think of it as uh, is, is important. And this whole strategy uh, it can be seen as a way of extracting value and creating business models outside of a network system. So I wanted to look at some of these platform strategies in practice so we can think about what they might be and how they're used these days. The open web um, you know, is, is again meant to inherit some of the difficult to control aspects of the internet. And for the first decade, you know, the main barriers were arguably actually the skill to, to write websites and the barriers to hosting in terms of resources, deployment, having a computer connected to the internet and for it to be always on and powered up and, and so on and in a reliable place of network connection. That's changed over time, not because it's necessarily more difficult to set up a website, although there are actually new barriers there. Um, but because we find actors have bounded this network and in practice made the experience of many users in this space uh, you know, going through the lens of this new platform economy. So think about the web browser. Well, today, Google Chrome is the dominant browser around the world. I think this is, last time I checked, this was in, in every jurisdiction except for Armenia, uh, where Armenia has a very high proportion of Firefox usage, which I think was a glitch at the time based on Chrome not properly supporting Armenian characters. Um, I think that might have changed now. So, so in practice, Chrome is dominant around the world. And even if Google Chrome is not dominant, then its underlying browser engine of Chromium is dominant in the markets where um, Chrome itself is not dominant. So those two things are a little bit distinct, but I think people in the room likely know um, about that. And we also know that only three web rendering engines really remain in the world that are, are practically maintained. That's um, uh, Chrome, which is uh, well, effectively Chrome, which is powered by Blink, uh, uh, Firefox, which now is, is Gecko, it's sometimes called, and uh, Safari, which is WebKit. Uh, and these three browser rendering engines are uh, you know, in, in, in significant control of this market. Um, but Chrome is now the more dominant one. And it has really disintermediated 
organizations like the W3C for setting web standards, because while W3C still meets, does very good and important work, uh, it does face a constant challenge of the web is what Chrome decides is renderable uh, at the speed that Chrome decides uh, it is going to be implemented. And if standards go above, beyond, faster, or slower than W3C, well, W3C is, is therefore a body that will be paid attention to, but is not determinant of what people see and operate on the internet. Um, and this becomes more fraught as some of the W3C standards become more tightly entwined with issues of security and revenue um, on the modern web. So the browser is effectively one way of capturing this network by suggesting that, in practice, you can only render things in certain ways. Google also controls parts of the web through discoverability. So effectively disciplining some of these network nodes by saying, well, you have to act in a certain way, otherwise we will make you less discoverable to other users of this network. Um, and uh, search is an obvious example of this, although there are other ways that Google, have disciplined, Google has disciplined its uh, parts of the network. For example, here, accelerated mobile pages, which we'll look at in a moment, but also schemas and data schemas, such as your opening hours, for example. How are you framing them? In what kind of code are you writing them? How are you passing these on your website? Uh, and as this, is a, as this is occurring, websites have to start to follow these standards. Otherwise, they will fall into obscurity. And the, even the threats of doing this are very significant. So both Google's threats have significantly shaped the way websites are designed and coded. Uh, we also find that Facebook and similar companies have used uh, threats of um, demonetizing and deranking in order to shape their, um, their, 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 the media in particular. So Facebook had famously, um, uh, almost about 10 years ago now, suggested that they would downlist or at least deprioritize media organizations that did not have video content. And you may remember this because it was a point where newspapers started to hire a lot of video producers and also lay off a lot of traditional print journalists. And they used to go to a news website and there'd be like an inordinate amount of completely, quite poorly produced often video that wouldn't be very informative or telling you things you needed to do. And this was largely because Facebook had told them to do this. And they panicked. They panicked that they would lose revenue. They started to change the way that their, uh, their businesses operated and produced media. Indeed, it turned out later that Facebook's um, threats about uh, how many users were watching videos as well were given to advertisers and publishers based on false information. They were providing the um, number of people who had watched a video even for one or two seconds before turning it off when it was on autoplay. And this was in, uh, connected to a large settlement in the United States as Facebook was sued over that misleading practice. <coughs> so this idea of, of being able to penalize and discipline parts of a network because you are controlling discoverability has become increasingly important. Income as well. Google is also heavily in control of the advertising ecosystem. We'll look at that a bit more tomorrow, for those of you who want to come to that. But sites have to follow Google's technical contractual terms for display advertising. This is a system that actually used to be called authorized buyers. It renamed itself recently. Um, and it's effectively a standard for uh, display advertising. And if websites don't play along with this, then they're not going to be able to participate in these large auction markets for advertising. Aesthetics is another area in which there's a significant amount of control um, issued by Google. And it's particularly this kind of potential control. It's very hard to find a website nowadays which isn't using either Google Fonts or calling JavaScript from a Google server. Um, and a minified version often is a sort of compressed version of a file that is used for people to call a certain version of, say, Bootstrap or some popular website template. This is an interesting kind of infrastructure because it is effectively requiring all websites to call home to Google in order to function. We see similar kind of you know, arcane maybe um, technical expansions by Google into um, taking over a significant portion of the DNS space uh, by, by um, making themselves the resolver of choice in many different software and hardware architectures. Um, and uh, this is just one method of extending this control. And it's not necessarily a power that you can see immediately, but it presents the potential for future power. So looking at these things together, these are just some of the ways in which a network that seems difficult to control has had tentacles extend into it. So we can see here that Google, um, just to give you one example of how Google used some of this power in practice, uh, Google threatened, similarly for deranking, de that 
um, news websites that didn't use um, accelerated mobile pages, a new code base for producing quite compressed websites that um, using a sort of restricted version of JavaScript um, with restricted libraries uh, that the Google claim would work better on mobile phones that may be data and resource, con resource constrained, uh, that they would then reduce them in, in ranking. So Google said, we're going uh, to change the search unless you use AMP. And if you do use AMP, we will also mirror your, your website on Google servers, and it will be cached, and it will be closer to the users due to um, the way that they would uh, have servers around the world to, to mirror as content um, delivery systems uh, closer to users and so on. So this was kind of a lot of websites changed. I mean, everyone remember maybe, or some people might remember seeing newspapers that say AMP dot the newspaper when you go to the URL as a result. Now, this is a recent complaint from many attorneys general in the United States around ad tech and Google, uh, in which they point out, discovered through uh, leaked release emails as part of the lawsuit, that Google used their code base to artificially insert a one second delay into something called header bidding. Header bidding is a competitor approach to Google's advertising system. Effectively, when Google sells adverts, they're about bidding for people's eyeballs. We'll look at these a bit more tomorrow. Um, but that bid, that auction for which advert gets delivered to which person at which time, happens on Google servers, the double-click system, which they acquired in the early 2000s. Um, header bidding, instead, is an auction which actually happens inside users' browsers. So it was orchestrated using HTML and JavaScript, um, and therefore it would take a core part of power away from Google as it, things wouldn't flow to the central auction house, which Google was in control of. It could instead happen in the browser and potentially open up a series of markets. So in order to stop this, Google used AMP uh, to reduce the load time of non-AMP ads by giving them an artificial one-second delay to make it look like AMP was the solution people should be using and penalize people who used header bidding in particular within that system. This had a significant effect killing, uh, you know, really killing header bidding at this point in time and seeing off a, a, a competitor. Uh, yeah, Google, Google employees grappled with how to publicly justify Google making something slower. What I think is interesting about this story is the way in which uh, something that looks quite benign, like an attempt to make a code base that would run faster on people's mobile devices and enable them to read the news faster with less load on the servers of the newspapers, it was provided for free to those newspapers, is actually a source of power. And we can see the same thing. We can imagine the same kind of power coming through Google Fonts or, uh, or any kind of code that's embedded on, Google, on, on websites. And all of those kind of networked um, uh, tentacles of power inside an open network we saw on the last slide are amenable to these kind of approaches in future. And so we have to be very careful with these platform strategies because it's almost like a magpie, you know, the bird that gathers lots of silver pieces in a nest. It's not that these companies have some big Montgomery Burns style like plan to think through what exactly they want to do with this power they accumulate. Instead, they will be accumulating small little pieces with a lot of potential that later down the line can be configured to exclude competitors, to change services, to alter the markets, to adjust in ways they see fit. And this makes it particularly difficult to regulate. It's difficult to regulate potential power, right? Like, you can regulate actions when somebody does something that you don't really like. If they found out as it was going on that this was happening, then a court could, make an could pass an injunction against Google and say, no, you can't roll out that change. That wouldn't be allowed. No, they didn't know it was happening behind closed doors, which makes it difficult. But this potential power, this accumulation of things that, that look benign but actually are, are ways of, of grappling and coordinating and bounding networks, is difficult to identify. We can see the same thing happening for apps and smartphones, taking the example of Apple in particular. When the iPhone initially launched in the first version of the iPhone, there were no apps. People might not even remember that happening. You know, because it was also it was like a thing that was like a bit trendy. People thought that, well, you know, why would I go this? Many people were happy with their, uh, their feature phones that, that didn't have those, those features or had some kind of a Palm device or similar kind of PDA with uh, telephony technology that was a little bit more open and they could uh, you know, fit in. Particularly, I think, if you were someone who actually had quite specific needs for a device, um, then an iPhone seemed very restricted. But the initial model of the iPhone was a model of web apps that 
people or companies could make you know, pretty looking mobile apps uh, that would be fully coded in HTML. They could save them onto the home screen as a bookmark and they would load up fairly seamlessly within Safari on the um, iPhone. But they backpedaled very quickly within about a year and a bit uh, and created the App Store. This seems to be due to an internal set of discussions around power on the phone. Um, and it linked to, over the coming years from Apple, a degradation of the functionality of web apps. The web could be seen as a threat to a company like Apple who was very excited by the idea of like, complete total control, effectively. Um, uh, the web allows people to code what they want, to use sensors that, in the way that they want a lot of the time, to use resources on the device, to access network functionality that they might like at the time they might like. Um, and web apps were increasingly growing with, uh, with uh, you know, new standards from the W3C and so on. Um, but within the iPhone, well, not all of this functionality was extended. The ability to use things like Bluetooth from web apps was not extended. Wi-Fi and accessing many of the hardware functionalities of the phone were not permitted by web apps when they were permitted to native apps. Um, there was little support for even discovering that web apps existed. Um, the, the effort of which you can still add them today on a phone, but the, on an iPhone, but the effort of adding them is still uh, very tricky. There was no sort of um, uh, app store-like functionality for browsing web apps and for having users who would, did not know what they were or did not know the difference between the web and an app um, uh, download this kind of functionality. And so we get to the point where everything starts to become an app on the app store, regardless of the fact there was no need for half this stuff to be compiled code um, pre-compiled before download. It was often doing something very simple, like just information retrieval or, um, or, or, or some kind of pretty functionality, um, and nothing that would uh, justify any performance benefits you might get from taking things out of web technologies. Apps also contain all these opportunities for control, so API restrictions, library restrictions, uh, you can, uh, uh, Apple operate a series of many private APIs, which they only grant to certain app developers um, and certain apps themselves. Um, some of those apps could be controlled by states, and they might get a few more APIs. Some of them might be controlled by trusted developers, and they might get a few more APIs through quite opaque series of negotiations. There are also rules on subscriptions, so heavily restricted where you can um, pay for an apps. And this has been on a set of ongoing lawsuits around whether you can say, take a subscription that you bought on the web and put it into the app for something like the Spotify music service. Um, part of this relates to the way that if you buy anything within the app, um, Apple will charge a commission that can be up to 30% of the uh, cost of what you're purchasing, therefore money going straight into Apple's coffers for something as simple as being the intermediary in this situation. And you can only do that as long as you restrict people from being able to actually pay and then enable functionality based on payment outside of that app ecosystem, which they do through a series of contractual reviews, um, contractual binding for that developer, uh, technical reviews um, and code reviews. You have to submit the source code uh, for analysis. Um, this makes it very difficult and has been for many years for people to make uh, things like apps that can access uh, terminals, um, apps that can uh, run or compile code on device that would enable people to even learn how to code. These apps have regularly been refused access to the App Store or, or removed. Uh, and one of the reasons being is you're reinventing the web inside the app. You know, if Apple said, well, you can make a system that could actually uh, enable any kind of arbitrary code to be created, executed, downloaded, and compiled, well, you've almost got an app within an app, and you immediately disintermediate Apple's ability to um, restrict what's going on. So closing down anything very open-ended has been a strategy of an app, the App Store for a very long time in exactly the same way that they closed down the way that web apps were and could be created. So app stores have been a source of power here as well. And looking at Apple, we've seen really heavy vertical integration, perhaps more than any other uh, technology firm in the entire world, uh, which you know, comes from the deep control and design of the hardware down to the cloud services and all these points of control in between. This whole stack of control does give an extraordinary amount of power, uh, of which I'll give some examples of, um, of, of in a moment. So one example was um, 
a pandemic-related example. So in 2020, many states at the beginning of 2020 wished to use mobile phones in order to mitigate issues in the pandemic. They wished to use, they didn't really know at the time which functionality they wanted to use, but they were told through a mix of techno solutionists and just you know, people who wanted to sell things that phones would help. And phones maybe could help. Um, uh, but navigating this space is a very, very tricky one, not only for reasons of privacy and data and control, but also for reasons of practicality, efficacy. This was happening very quickly, being developed and deployed very quickly, but also being developed and deployed in an atmosphere of the control that we just saw. Uh, and this is something that I got involved in quite quickly, so with colleagues uh, really led by EPFL down the road from here, um, uh, we sort of started to talk together in, in uh, mid-March, uh, of um, 2020, and uh, Carmela Troncoso, who is based in the, um, uh, the information department at the IC, is a computer scientist based in EPFL. She uh, led a team saying, well, ultimately, if we're going to go down this road of developing a way for people to be notified or, or, or detected if they've been near somebody who, who later tested positive for COVID-19, what we should do is we should make sure this is human rights preserving and as privacy and confidentiality preserving as possible while also enabling functionality that is being desired. So we mocked up a protocol um, through you know, a variety of like remote means uh, very rapidly without very much sleep in March and April, um, uh, in early April 2020. It's also got very political with a series of European initiatives and international initiatives at this point, um, some of which were captured in various ways. Um, uh, Kamala, who is a fantastic uh, academic, um, uh, was, was, was absolutely brilliant at leading this uh, system. And the, pr the protocol we proposed was called DP3T, Decentralized Privacy Preserving Proximity Tracing. We'd released a white paper on this. Um, and, and effectively, the design space is fairly small for this. Well, the way it worked is that you had a telephone, and your telephone would be emitting random numbers, every maybe 15 minutes or less, or every, depending on the time interval. Um, every few minutes, your phone would emit a random number. Um, and that number would be you know, generated maybe from, a, from a, a private key and a seed on your device, or it could be as random as you can get on a device. Other phones would be listening for those numbers and writing down all the numbers they saw on the device. So like a diary of the numbers they saw. And it's really as simple as that. Yes, there's rules to write down things like strength and you know, signal strength and so on um, uh, and any kind of metadata that might come with those signals. And then were someone to test positive for COVID-19, well, they could upload a code on their device and the, the device would then send all the numbers that they emitted over that time period to a relay server. Everybody in the country or the jurisdiction that was relevant would download those numbers and they would be checked against your own local diary to say, okay, here's today's list of numbers that seem to be exposed. Did I see any of them? If I did, there would be a function for how long did I see them, and I could assess risk in a local function on that device, and then the device could notify you. So as you see, it's not a very complex protocol. Like it's, it's, there are practical difficulties in organizing a countrywide relay server and various other things, um, uh, but the protocol is, is very simple. Um, states, however, particularly France, England, and Wales, because it was jurisdictional for health, um, and Singapore, but there were others as well, instead wanted what could be called a centralized system. Now, of course, systems are ne never fully decentralized. There are always central points of control, so we have to think of which point of the system is centralized. The part we refer to here is effectively the matching and the establishment of this social graph, whereas the matching in our protocol happens on device, locally, the matching in the envisaged protocols by um, England, Wales, and France, and Singapore happened effectively on their servers. And when you match on the servers, you create a social graph of who sees who in society, including people who weren't infected or exposed at all. Um, and it's something that's very difficult to get rid of. Now, our, we had a, lot, a team, plenty of epidemiologists as well, who said, well, that data maybe would be a nice PhD project, but has no real operational use in the pandemic. Um, you know, the big data fallacy that this is like magical data that will help us beat the virus is not really obviously true. It's going to be very poor quality data. It's going to be useful for a certain level of, of operational accept acceptance with acceptance of false positives and false negatives. Um, but it's unlikely to give us a great insight about the, even the direction of travel of the virus because it's unclear which direction it goes in these networks. 
So various reasons why this data is not actually a, a gold mine for understanding, and the priority should probably be operational deployment. Now, this was a tense moment because what happened effectively after we'd proposed our protocol and when states were being very quiet about their protocols, actually, we knew what was going on a bit behind the scenes there, but they wouldn't be publishing their plans, and so we were kind of a bit of a lightning rod for this discussion, is Apple and Google paired up uh, in order to implement this technology. Initially, they wanted to not implement anything at all. Um, and indeed, it was pretty much impossible on an iPhone to make a solidly functioning app without the blessing of Apple. Not just for the App Store review reasons I've said before, but because inside the iPhone, there were protections against using Bluetooth in the background when an app was not active. Because of the passive tracking potential for Bluetooth, and there was there's a history of shops installing Bluetooth beacons to um, track shoppers around and say, you know, you install a, a loyalty card application, and the loyalty card is going, the application wants to sort of um, either beam out or listen to beacons in the environment so it can track your movements and profile you better for whatever inane thing they want to sell you. Uh, instead, this approach was, um, uh, you know, this was kind of curtailed somewhat by operating level restrictions on the, long, the length the Bluetooth could operate that could not be overridden by the user under any circumstances. So we knew from a very early period that to get any of these applications to work, you had to have the blessing of Apple who had to roll out a software update effectively. And Google for many of their phones had to do something similar. So they came together as a company, um, which is an unusual, we, we dealt a lot with them, an unusual situation, but um, the, uh, they came together and sort of slowly chugged out this, this, uh, this, this protocol that changed a bit over time. It was later called exposure notification. And it was effectively a version of DB3T, and they, they stated as much. Um, uh, but it did not provide an operating system API which allowed a centralized version to be produced. Now, thinking about those those, um, that protocol I just described, the way our protocol worked is you, when you were testing positive, your phone sent out all the numbers it had emitted for that period of time to other phones. At no point in our protocol did you ever send out on the net with the network any numbers that you received or heard. Right? It's just a feature that was not a necessary building block in our protocol. Similarly, in this operating system update, Apple prescribed very heavily the building blocks that could be called to the operating system that would allow it to use Bluetooth in the background and did not allow any identifiers that had been heard from the environment to be uploaded to the network level. This uh, it actually kept them on the secure enclave on the device, so cryptographic hardware on the device, which would make it, you know, if, if you were even trying to compromise the device, would make it very difficult to get these out. So this, this was a lack of a, of, of a building block. And this building block meant this API could not be repurposed to create a centralized version because centralized versions necessarily require connecting what has been heard and emitted at some point in the network layer. So that they just could not be emitted. Now, this was very distressing to these countries that were trying to make a centralized version. Now, from our point of view, um, yeah, we were both happy because the protocol that we thought was a more sensible idea was the one that states were going to go ahead with and implement as a result. We were also a bit disturbed that this decision was being made by an operating system. <laughs> you know, um, while we thought our arguments were very solid around the lack of no, the no need for this data to be produced centrally, um, we felt that those were strong and stood on their own. It is not a very um, comfortable situation to be in where you have an operating system making public health decisions. Uh, so this is an unusual and bizarre situation that I think highlighted to many states the power of these uh, platforms that they had not quite appreciated before. Um, in the end, so this system was, uh, was probably mostly successful actually in the UK, um, where a study, uh, of sort of, um, a study of its effectiveness that was published in Nature later on um, and indicated it probably saved about eight to 9,000 lives. Um, now, that probably was also related to a failure of the normal contact tracing system, so it was picking up a lot of the slack. Um, in Switzerland, this, this was a Swiss COVID app, um, but as we point out to many health providers, the technology is fairly easy. Integrating it with the health system is very difficult, and states often didn't take that next step to ensure that people actually were aware of this system, 
um, were, uh, were, were you know, putting uh, test codes onto it and so on, and were, it was integrated properly and how people could understand it. So uh, there's a lot of lessons that we published in communications with the ACM um, last year uh, in a paper called Deploying Decentralized Privacy Preserving Proximity Tracing. Um, sort of look at the, the, the wash-up of what happened in this space, if you're interested. Um, but certainly, it, was, uh, uh, you know, it, it wasn't a panacea, but neither was it meant to be. Our proposal initially was never a techno-solutionist fix this. It was a, if you want to do this, maybe here's an idea of how you should go about it, because at least it won't leave behind a legacy that could really be used to harm people. And we were talking about a system that was envisaged to interoperate across the world, including in many human rights, uh, not human rights respecting jurisdictions. So you know, a lowest common denominator approach seemed to be quite worthwhile, whereas one that revolved in heavy data collection that could really uh, you know, reveal heavy amounts about the kind of people other people interacted with um, does not seem appropriate in many countries um, today, unfortunately. Another quick... Um, Example, there was a video here, but it won't work. This is the PDF version of the presentation, unfortunately. Um, but you can find it. Is, um, uh, just quickly, Apple devices have a NFC chip. It's what you use for Apple Pay and so on. Uh, Post-Brexit, after the vote uh, in 2016, the UK government wanted to give um, uh, residents, uh, EEC residents who were uh, resident in the UK, an ability to very quickly and cheaply, without having to see somebody, apply for permanent residency which requires scanning a passport or ID card. Um, that's, those, those devices, as you know, have biometric NFC chips, and that's a fairly secure way to scan them. You know, at least, at least it was a, it's a fairly easy way to do it. But Apple uh, did not allow the government to use a sensor for this purpose. The government sent up many ministers to California, like, quite pathetically begging the company to, um, to, to allow them to use the chip. In the end, almost two years later, at their own speed, they updated for everybody an API that allowed, in a way that allowed some passport scanning far too late after all this had happened. Um, doesn't seem to be any major security issue or concern with like, expanding the sensor in this way, at least even, especially with it a constrained private API that only that government app could use at some point. But the company was really not responsive, and therefore there was an infrastructure in everybody's pockets that could have been used for a policy end that was not permitted to be used despite uh, heavy lobbying by a state. So again, this kind of lack of willingness to enable something is another example of this too. Now, platforms make pretty attractive regulatory access points for states because of their platform power. Because it's quite hard to regulate the internet, states feel like they want to both go through platforms to regulate. You know, the idea being that, that you know, we haven't found a way to block things on the internet, but if we find a way to block something on Google or on Facebook, then it does de facto block it for many different kinds of people, whereas internet blocking requires quite a significant infrastructure, um, is quite um, unreliable. Um, really, you have to have a significant commitment to reshaping this infrastructure in order for it to work because of the design principles I mentioned earlier on. So we see um, new pieces of regulation, such as the Digital Services Act in the EU, the Online Safety Bill in the UK or the IT rules in India, which all seek to um, regulate lots of content through platforms because platforms, the same power that gives platforms power can also give governments the ability to deputize them as intermediaries. Yet there's simultaneously this concern that platforms have too much power and maybe they should be smaller, broken up, less powerful. And we see those in Digital Markets Act or the new Digital Markets Competition and Consumers Bill in the UK and lots of initiatives around um, digital sovereignty or souveraineté numérique, um, which is like taking, around, taking off around the world. So these are sort of th this kind of complex relationship. Surveillance adds to this even more because platforms are extremely useful for state surveillance, particularly if you're the United States, where those platforms are within your jurisdiction. Um, you know, looking back to the Snowden leaks and the PRISM system that was uh, revealed in the Snowden documents, we know that the current providers that were on the list at this point uh, were already, uh, through warrants, able to provide huge amounts of personal data, and they joined over a period of time to effectively provide that straight to the surveillance state. Um, interesting enough, very, very cheaply, only costing $20 million per year to run this entire program. In comparison, at the same time, the NSA was paying AT&T uh, $0.5 billion a year in order to run a partial um, deep packet inspection, like internet buffering system, 
that could be used to search unencrypted uh, internet packets. Uh, and that was just a compensation for organizing some of the infrastructure involved in that. So the, the magnitude of comparison is just hugely different. So we find that there. Now, going back to what platforms want a little bit, so I think we've, we've seen some of the strategies they use, the, you, you know, they use to enclose networks and some of the uh, ways in which they can themselves be used. But there's two sets of logics I think are interesting to talk about. I draw on these from Julie Cohen, who's a professor at Georgetown in the US. And an interesting thing with, um, uh, you know, with, with, with her framework is I think it's a lot more a lot deeper and more abstract and helps us interrogate when we see a platform strategy what's really going on. So she talks about two logics, access and legibility. So the platforms are really trying to do two things. They try and make people, organizations, entities, audiences legible to them. So that might be sorting them out into groups or organizing like a distance matrix of who is more like who or working out communities or, or, um, or, or areas or trying to ass assign people risk scores or likes or profiles or interests. There's a huge variety of ways you could do this. You could also imagine it happening locally on your device, inside your browser. It doesn't have to rely on lots of centralized data collection. Um, it's just a legibility strategy. So there's also ways to do that using multi-party computation or cryptographic systems. So all of this can be seen as just ways to make the world more legible. And it's not about knowing something about someone. It is effectively about creating a strategy in which you can understand and manage that population. So it's a little bit different because this is not always going to be the case that platforms accumulate a huge amount of data and then use that to target people. So think about Apple. Apple is very proudly saying it is privacy sensitive, privacy friendly, doesn't accumulate loads of data about everybody, but it has plenty of strategies to render its users legible. Um, it's for them to work out, say, what they want to search for in the App Store and to target them that way, to have, to have their phone recognize what else they've subscribed to, um, and to create an experience that encourages them to subscribe to more things, for example, based on the way that they use their device. So these kinds of strategies are not restricted to organizations that collect data. They can also be organizations that shape infrastructures as to make uh, their users more legible to their businesses. And then the second point is access. So you give would-be counterparties, entities that want to interact and sell things to each other, the way to interact. And those legible groups, you might say, look, we've got a platform like Steam, which does video games. Well, we sell a multiple sizes market. We have developers. They make games. We have users who download these games using our platform. We have advertisers who also advertise this platform for more games. And all these kind of actors are linked with each other through this open-ended platform, a bit like a marketplace of some kind. So looking through this logic, you can often see what a platform's trying to achieve this combination of making different entities accessible to other entities and making different entities legible in different ways. And, and so there's a, I think it just goes a little bit deeper than, say, thinking that platforms are trying to do prediction about what we want or trying to know us or trying to survey us or trying to watch us. No, they often have more pernicious logics that, that those, ones can, those, those kind of logics can miss out a little bit. So lastly... I want to think about a movement that's happening from platforms to infrastructures. When we think of a phone, we often think about the things we can see on this device, content moderation or privacy settings or what transparency notices are we getting or so on. And we often miss more about the deeper aspect of this device, not only because unlike older PCs, in more and more modern devices, these features are increasingly hidden from us. APIs, on-device hardware, background processes, the new sensors, the ways they're being configured or used in the background. Most people will not know the kind of sensors that are on their phone um, and the extent to them. And particularly new sensors like ultra-wideband or similar kinds of capabilities uh, and what they are really capable of and how they can be configured and reconfigured. And this view points to how these are really distributed computational infrastructures around the entire country or world that are capable of being coordinated by orchestrating actors like Apple or similar to achieve certain functionality. Um, and if we see it that way, you know, we see it this networked infrastructure that is pretty um, capable of being configured and reconfigured. 
I think the biggest example of this in recent years is around finding devices and the new location networks. So in 2019, Apple launched the Find My Network. Um, it was initially called something slightly different, offline, offline finding, I think it was called before. Um, and what they did is they remotely reprogrammed iPhones, iPads, and laptops um, to search for Bluetooth signals in the environment and act as finder beacons. And they did this without asking the people who own these devices whether they wanted to be part of this, this new, um, basically, telecommunications network that they were setting up. Um, and they were finding devices that didn't have connectivity or GPS because they had low battery or something like this. So you've probably seen these air tags, or if you have um, Apple headphones, they also have this feature, and more so many bikes and things have this fitted in automatically now, the Find My Network um, technology. Uh, effectively, it means that the way it roughly works is that uh, if your device is, um, loses uh, connection for a while with uh, a device it recognizes, like a phone, it will start to beam out a sort of I'm lost, help me signal, which is effectively a, a, a public key um, that it's beaming out. And so it's beaming out this public key. And this public key relates to a private key inside a user's account. And when a device sees this lost public key emission, uh, a finder device, so anyone's iPhone or, 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 or iMac in this room uh, who has one, when it sees that, that, that device will automatically um, wrap up, it'll use the public key to encrypt both the name of the device and a location coordinate um, uh, that can only be decrypted then by the owner of the private key, and it will send it up to, uh, to basically a bulletin board that Apple hosts, and the user can go and look at that bulletin board and say, I've got this public key, is my device on this list yet? And they'll go, oh, no, 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 oh, yeah, there it is, I can see it. You can download the file, you can decrypt it using your private key, and it contains the location of your device. So that's the broad functionality of the way this works. They did this. Amazon also tried to compete. They did a different thing. They, remote, they, didn't, they don't have all these finder networks in our devices, so they remotely reprogrammed in the US all the Amazon Alexa or Echo devices and ring doorbells uh, and certain cameras, it was actually some security cameras, to um, broadcast out a LoRa network. A LoRa network is, is, a, is a type of wireless network on an unlicensed spectrum, which can go for about a mile away, roughly, if you're in good conditions, I think. People are nodding. They know much more than I do about this, I'm sure. Um, and the idea being is that they could use that to also similarly find devices that don't have good connectivity, GPS, or battery, such as a, a tile, which is their sort of finder equivalent. So they both reprogrammed devices that people owned into completely new functionality. And it was kind of chaotic. Within an eight-month period, US police departments documented 50 times, just, 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 the, just a few departments um, that were surveyed by investigative journalists said, well, we've seen at least 50 cases of stalking involving air tags. You know, this, this, was a, this was deployed without anyone's permission, without any safeguards on this, it was deployed. Now, several years later, just last week, Apple and Google announced they're starting a standard at the IETF to try and like, stop stalker use of this by having a detection mechanism. Like, several years after this was just rolled out initially, and with no obvious implementation of this across all devices on the horizon, and even if it is implemented, on eBay you can buy devices that have any like, uh, beeping or tracking functionality like, taken out of them. So uh, there are plenty of ways to abuse this, even with that standard going forward. So this was a technology rolled out without that kind of permission. So we see that while we've got things like pipes, cables and so on, that are infrastructures, these have fairly defined capabilities. We kind of know that pipes carry water. I mean, one day someone might pour acid into them and start transporting acid around, but we also know they just kind of carry some liquid. Like, they can't be vastly repurposed. Um, uh, of course, we can see some changes. So railways now carry, like, broadband um, uh, uh, fiber optic cables all the way down them because, like, they're also repurposed in that way, because they are, they, you know, they're, they're useful tracts of land to do that without much permission to be granted. But they can't suddenly change in functionality entirely. Like, a, a railway network can't suddenly start, like, to put on Broadway shows. You know, <laughs> like, that's, like, the functionality is pretty set down. 
But with these technologies, it's not so set. Like, these are open-ended computational infrastructures that can be rapidly programmed into something that people did not expect and did not have any, um, any reason to expect when they bought this device. I don't want to bore people with law because, you know, you don't want to, you know, think come to CERN to be bored by lawyers, I'm sure. Um, but laws don't really deal with this very well so far. So competition law, you know, deals with big companies, but doesn't really say much about the political purposes to what some of these uh, initiatives should be put. It's more interested in stopping dominant power. It's not really interested in saying, well, to what ends should this power be used? So it doesn't really help us very much. Public utility lenses, well, again, it doesn't really, uh, it focuses a lot on the efficiency of a utility like water and how effective and efficient it is. It doesn't, again, it doesn't say about the ends of this open-ended system. So we sort of assume we know what public utilities do when we start to organize them. Um, and if we do start to um, yeah, use this lens, it doesn't really function super well. There's a few other lenses in, in the, particularly the, the research literature. Some people call themselves digital constitutionalists, which uh, sort of implies that, that um, there are some side effects of the digital economy uh, that need regulation like a human rights regime. But these are not really side effects. This is the entire model of the digital economy is turning into this, this, this reshaping and open-ended discussion. So I'm not convinced this really helps us very much. And digital sovereignty uh, is another motivating issue, but it's heavily tied up with geopolitics and relations from one state to another, and less really about domestic issues and, and power within a state, which this also is involved in. So these current approaches don't really work. We can learn a little bit from some legal approaches. So we've got telecommunications law, I mean, that's quite interesting because we do sort of say that some companies provide something that is so useful and essential informationally that we need to regulate them. But it focuses a lot on things like neutrality. So act, like, have we got access to broadband and internet? And is it neutral? Are packets being transmitted fairly and evenly? But neutrality is not a very useful lens to think about the ends of our technology either. We have to think about more of a positive configuration. Now, media law is interesting in that regard because it often does think a bit more of a positive configuration. You think, okay, this percentage of media in this country should be based in this language, should be representing this community. It should be fair and impartial during an election. You know, it should have these characteristics. We should have some documentaries and some news. And if it's news, it should have these characteristics. Um, but it's very difficult to do that in a very fast-moving world as well. It still has an idea that's quite static, and media law, too, has struggled to keep up with things like video streaming services or influencers or uh, new social media platforms and, and keep up there. So we have a little bit to learn from that, but still need to um, build on that. So my last slide is about foundations of a new approach here. Uh, this is some work I've do, been doing with my postdoc, Petros Terzis, both at UCL. Um, and we've been thinking here about a few bases to build on regulation of this space, firstly to reframe it and to build upon it. Programmability being a matter of public interest and saying, well, if you're going to have an infrastructure that can be programmed and reprogrammed, you know, in whose interest is being programmed? Well, this is a public interest and this is a political matter. So we first have to reframe it in that way slightly, which it currently is not. We then have to think about what political participation looks like in that space. Now, I don't mean that we all have a referendum or a vote on each infrastructural change. It has to be more nuanced than that. But at the moment, what's the role of civil society here? What's the role of um, different actors and, um, and the like in this space? It's gonna be difficult because political participation you know, cannot just be, I think, a state level issue. I mean, states have a lot of security and surveillance interests here. Um, and we have to navigate between human rights concerns the, uh, the desires to which states would put infrastructures if they had that ability, the geopolitics, that's those states, and also small communities, local communities, local needs, and different uh, scales. It's a very complex issue, and it's very hard to reconcile the global with the local. But we have to give it a go in order to um, work out an appropriate level of governance, an appropriate arrangement of an infrastructure that can be governed. So it might mean smaller infrastructures or more friction or things going a bit slower, um, but that may be a necessary precondition. And lastly, we struggle to have positively configured infrastructures when we demand that they are. Courts can't do this, for example. Like a court is not going to turn around and say, we want your technology to do X or Y or Z in a specific way. Um, they don't feel like they have that authority or that expertise in order to say, you know, imagine a court said, we want your system to be configured 
to enable offline finding of devices. Well, the company could say, well, that's not possible. We can't understand how we would do that, and so on. So it was very hard for courts, but also for regulators, to get into a discussion about what should happen. What functionality do we want, and how should it be organized? So we have to get institutions that are able to come up with meaningful design approaches. They have access openly and transparently to some of the schemas of these systems. They can propose and counter-propose design changes that they can maybe see enacted in the world, or they can negotiate to be enacted. Um, and that can be a matter of, of politics as well. Because at the moment, we are stuck taking options from companies and not necessarily giving them. So thank you very much for listening. Happy to take any questions. And hopefully, yeah. Thank you so much for your magnificent lecture. Oh, thank you. Really, it was great. Um, I have a naive question, in fact. But, <clears throat> you know, there is uh, the structure where we, that we have consists of some large companies, Apple, Google, who have a lot of power. Now, well before the internet, there was the Sherman Act, I am not a lawyer, so correct me if I say something wrong, that was supposed to deal uh, with uh, antitrust and monopolistic situation. Mm -hmm. Very much to my surprise, the US that broke up the Rockefeller Empire with the Sherman Act mm -hmm. has allowed this giant to become so large mm -hmm. and does not apply the Sherman Act. Couldn't be an alternative, I mean, couldn't it be theoretically an alternative uh, strategy to deal with such concentration of power? Thanks, it's a great question. Competition law, I think partly, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why it's not been applied. Um, and I'm not a competition lawyer and they are a very different kind of uh, beast in many ways. They are very interested in market outcomes, and it's quite difficult to reason about those when systems are free. It's quite difficult to reason about those when it's not always great to think about markets when you think about these quite difficult structures of technical control. Companies like Apple will say, well, some people buy Google phones, but that's maybe the wrong level of comparison of competition when they miss the idea of the control of the supply chain or, or the steering of, of those infrastructures. Many companies like Google maintain control over their systems despite having open sourced them and given them to foundations like Android. You know, so these things become quite difficult to reason about. Uh, and there are certainly many constantly competition conferences and so on. But they rely so heavily on economics as a way to structure their thinking that I think they don't get into these quite deep levels of infrastructural control because economics is not very good at theorizing about infrastructural power. So I suppose that's where I depart a lot from competition, and I think it's probably why uh, we haven't seen many antitrust actions. Now, there have been some. Microsoft famously like, had actions against Internet Explorer being bundled with Windows. Um, but by the time that happened, it was too late, and Netscape was already dead, although it sort of lives on in Firefox and similar. Right? Um, uh, so I, I think there's, a, uh, you know, there, there's some hope in competition, but... They are really stuck in a very deep orthodoxy. And part of that is, it does relate to this. The competition law does have the power to positively configure new markets. It can say, you know, do this, don't, that, you know, don't do that. You can't merge in this way. You have to split up in this way. Or you have to organize a business with um, you know, firewalled parts of your company. It can be very creative. And it's quite hard to make that creativity accountable. So I think when regulators have come into this space, they're getting quite scared of, of um, uh, well, of, of, of killing the golden goose in a way. Killing this sort of, they're told that the innovation relies on these large companies, whereas we're seeing them now more as bureaucracies, quite you know, like slowing things down, consolidating power. You know, if anyone's had to deal with Apple, I find them not a very innovative company at all. They're one of the most inefficient companies I've ever dealt with. They just have so much money, they hide their inefficiencies. So I, I think this is a uh, a, 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 a very curious direction, but um, I'm we're also bearing in mind that I mentioned a few of the laws that are emerging, the Digital Markets Act in the European Union, and there's a new Competition Act in the UK. These are competition people trying to grapple with digital power, um, but it's a slow journey, and I think it's because their frame is slightly wrong. 
Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Thank you both. Any other questions? I cannot see everybody from behind the door. Yes, please. Please, please use the microphone. Because there is a recording. You don't have a microphone. Yeah, OK. Uh, so thank you also for your very nice talk. It was a pleasure to listen to. And I was wondering regarding the new acts, do they have, um, like, would you say they, they have a reasonable way of controlling or regulating platforms that, like you said at the beginning of the talk, just kind of grow too large, right? That, that, that there are, there are, like, there's nobody stopping people from using something else or like a st different standard, but it's just so large that it has become a common, common thing that 90% of people don't even know about anything else. Yeah, so if you check the Digital Markets Act, for example, the way that's structured is there are conditions under which you become a gatekeeper, and that's by being very large in one particular or two areas, like running an operating system or having an app store or running a social network. And then you start to trigger certain obligations, like you can't combine data across two or more of these services without, without consent, actually. It doesn't really help that way. Um, if you have an app store, you may have to allow a second app store to be installed that isn't yours. But they're quite... The devil is in the details with these implementations. So if you tell Apple you have to allow another, allow another app store, is it really going to stop them limiting the APIs and the lower level of control that they have? Um, they might say, well, we'll have an app store that just allows pornography now as well, like the Cedia app store. And so it's very surface level as a, as a source, of, issue, a source of, of, of change. And then they'll do that. You'll go back and forth, and then maybe someone will try to sue them, and then they'll try and counter sue, and then they'll be like five years later or more down the road in the European Court of Justice, and we haven't really got much further with, uh, with this. So there are, a lot, there, and there are other kinds of um, provisions in the Digital Markets Act, which, for example... Uh, are meant to require Apple, the NFC sensor, for example, that I gave the example of, uh, to say, well, you should allow multiple um, services, like, like payment services, to use it. So you can't just have Apple Pay. You also need to open the sensors to bank apps so that they can use it in their own way if they want. But does that really stop them making their service a bit more attractive for a user interface or work best with new sensors they have time to even predict they're going to release? You know, And, 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 and so all of this kind of power... I think has ways around some of these provisions which are playing catch up a little bit. But to be forward looking, we have to imagine the future. And it's very hard to imagine the future when there are organizations out there that consider their job to create the future. And so we're always imagining something in the sense that we're imagining what these organizations want to create tomorrow. And that feels like we'd always be playing catch up there. So instead, we might need to create a political vision of what we want and the direction we want technology to go and find ways to make that the future rather than just have to be in reactive mode the whole time to what we're given. And I think we're far away because um, you know, political parties and their manifestos, Now I know not many people are voting on political party manifestos in Switzerland at least, um, but, um, but in other countries yeah, where party manifestos are very like, uh, detailed and, and, and important um, uh, parts of, of democracy, um, they barely contain anything about digital issues at all. If they do, they're like, we want to penalize data breaches or stop cold calls or you know, something like this. They don't say, here is our positive vision as a party for the digital future. They haven't quite got to a way of articulating that yet. So we need to get there. And it really requires, in a way, politicians to step up. Because without that, you know, people's political preferences don't just come from within their hearts. They're also a reflection of the options they have on the table. And they're not given different options. Um, and, and, you know, there's also a problem, like the very kind of cyber libertarian, techno-solutionist option is, is interesting, like we were talking earlier on today about, about Solid, for example, and, and uh, a more decentralized web going forward. And, of course, it's uh, you know, very much related to the history of CERN. You know, I'm also not sure that that political vision of, like, everybody taking a large amount of time and effort to, like, govern their own part of the Internet is going to work either. So we have to balance, like, the dreams of technolo technologists who think we could have this different kind of network with um, the reality of what people like, want and the convenience they want and find ways to map that in the middle that isn't just sinking into a very large platform structure. That will be very challenging. Thank you very much.
Any other question? Uh, yes, Jack. I thank thank you very much for the for the lecture. Very interesting. I, I was thinking more of uh, about like more of a technical angle to to possible solutions because because obviously this uh, involves having like uh, very highly uh, high technical skills in order to deploy alternative solutions. And th those technical, high technical skills are typically drained by the ones who are actually creating the problem, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. so this is tricky because typically you start like some alternative projects, like some small master servers or I don't know, somewhere else or some other things. And then uh, as people get good at those things, they are typically just yeah. drained into the into the, like big tech. Uh, and so I, I was wondering from, from a policy point of view if there is if this is something that is discussed about like encouraging also I don't know, in EU there is like traditionally a, a, a small medium an SME mm -hmm. like ecosystem that is kind of the backbone, but this is being also sucked away because most of the infrastructure and, uh, and the basic services are becoming like a commodity that yeah. also the EU buy from American companies, right? So I don't know if... Uh... Yeah, that's a great question. There are, so there's aspects like digital sovereignty um, where that's attracting countries now to invest, but they're not really sure what they're investing in. So you see a lot of investments saying creating our own large language model for our own country. So the French government put a lot into uh, Bloom, which was a a multilingual language model that was released open source. The European Commission has a program called the Next Generation Internet, NGI, which funds a lot of different things in this area, but isn't a gigantic funding program. It does do interesting, important work um, in this space. Uh, there's always a challenge, I think, of scalability and how much these can be rolled out. But I think they don't really, you know, they're kind of doomed to fail until they start to grapple with the underlying infrastructure because they can always be disintermediated by the underlying infrastructure. They can always be wiped off by, you know, app stores or changing sensors or changing drivers or having to keep up with changing standards, which were just very, very cost draining as, as an issue. Um, uh, where do I think it could, could go? Uh, I think, yeah, if, we, if it does go a bit, a bit deeper, we might have a little bit more, um, more hope for this. Um, I don't think it will go anywhere until countries start to recognize that digitization is not a universal good thing. Because when we say we want to digitize SMEs or small companies, what do we mean by that? We don't just mean like make them use ones and zeros more. You know, there's generally the idea that they adopt products and services to, to informationalize their, um, their business. But what that means is often like adopting Microsoft or Google products and adopting, like, you know, we're falling into the hands of large platforms. And these small companies end up becoming kind of appendages, just, just tools of a much larger infrastructure. You know, like people say now, well, systems like GPT-4 or, um, or, or other similar language model technologies or other image model technologies are going to take over a lot of different kinds of business. Well, what does that really mean? Does it mean that businesses will end up making API calls constantly to central platforms in order to achieve any purpose, even data linkage. You know, in that case, digitization is a restructuring of that industry so that tasks cannot be completed without going through a digital infrastructure that is owned by somebody else. And that's nothing about you know, digitization. There are many ways to digitize that don't involve like completely handing off control of your stability and, and task of your business to another industry. But they're not really being seen that way by countries because countries have quite a linear view of digitization. Like, you know, more innovation is good, but they don't question to what, you know, what do we mean by innovation, what do we mean by digitization? Are some forms of innovation and digitization really forms of capture? Uh, I think that is where, as soon as we get out of that mindset, and start to see the political economy behind digitization, we might be able to start to say, well, which kind of digitization we want, and then get exactly into the kind of questions that you were saying around smaller infrastructures or alternative infrastructures and how we actually give resources to creating and maintaining them because we see them as a public good. At least just a small comment in where I come from in Germany, oftentimes, uh, like, governmental digitalization just means that the forms that are usually filled out uh, on paper are now scanned and then yeah. sent through emails or yeah. like through a secure server. But like you say, it, it actually needs a different mindset where you can actually 
you have the data I don't know saved on a secure server and then you just said like the government like the, there is a, a web service that you can just click a button right and apply for something yeah often, of, yeah and it often requires navigating with what standards you're trying to use what you're trying to express in this data what other parts of your organizations want and need what frontline people actually require in their jobs and these are all done in situ right you've got two options you either look at your current organization and make a digital approach that is well suited to that task or you accept an off-the-shelf product from some company that's selling a digitization tool and say I have to change my organization's task to fit this product and say we no longer do the process in the way we used to we fit this homogenized global platform because that is its business model its business model is scale you know re repeating with low marginal cost this in many, many places. So they want you, they want, this is why I'm saying discipline in networks. They want to discipline parts of that network to be the same because only when it's the same can they sell something repeatedly. And that's the sad, you know, that's the sad thing with digital government. Is it's really someone coming and saying, do government this way rather than we will digitize your processes. And also, there's probably a reason your process is like this. Like it probably contains some important policy thing. Yeah, of course, some processes are nonsense, you know, but treating everything as nonsense that should be homogenized is a recipe for total disaster. And we've all encountered it in our lives, and we've all been frustrated with it when, when an organization has done that, because what they think the task is does not fit what the actual task is. And it's often not their fault, because it's the fault of an external party. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody. Oh, show you all. Uh, just another comment. Uh, it's not to be taken for granted that uh, big um, companies such as Apple, Google, are actually at the center of innovation. A University of Chicago professor, whose name I forgot, has made, in fact, the opposite argument, that they are slowing innovation, and gave this as one reason why, in fact, we are observing in the economy a slow, <coughs> a, a decrease in productivity, in productivity growth. Mm. And that has been going on for years, that mm. in fact the productivity is not increasing as fast as we would like it to increase. Yeah, no, completely. I think we have to start to challenge our assumptions qualitatively about what's going on and encourage economists and other disciplines to do the same. Um, because what we're seeing here is, you know, uh, is really evidence that the problem is deeper and more complex. And if we simplify it at a level of supply and demand, you know, we miss these longer dynamics of capture. Cool. So Thank I you think very much. given that tomorrow we have another opportunity <laughs> with the subject of uh, tracking past, present, and future, where there is a lot of uh, uh, material for discussion, I think we thank Michael for today, thank you so much, and we meet again tomorrow 11 o'clock here.